Hello. Um, I'm Matty from Kilda Home, um, and this is um, a presentation that's based on an article that I've, I've published earlier this year. Um, so I have slimmed it down massively because, it, as you can tell, it's a huge topic spanning um, 1500 years um, from the Saxon period, so from the post Roman period up to the modern day. Um, my inspiration for this was taken from um, a series of paintings that I found by William Hogarth. I didn't find them, they weren't in my attic. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be if an only, Yeah, I wouldn't be here. Um, that I, I found sur surfing the internet about animals and various things. Um, he was a painter and a satirist and a, um, a social critic of the um, 18th century. And um, in particular, he painted a series of um, pictures um, showing um, four stages of cruelty. He, he liked to do the social commentary. And this one is um, very interesting for us. As you can see, this poor unfortunate dog is um, not having a very good time of it. Um, just let me work here. Just here. Um, and other animals are being taunted um, and treated very badly. The cat up here being burnt, not the post. So, um, William Hogarth is observing all these things happening in, in his life in London in the 18th century, and he's very worried by it. And this series of paintings shows how, from starting out at a young age, I think um, the, the protagonist in this series is uh, Tom Nero, and he's torturing his dog here. And from starting out from torturing animals, we move through life, he becomes an older person, and we see um, here he is beating a horse and there's other things happening, sheep are being beaten, and it shows that not even animals, but even young children are being run over in the street, so <coughs> it's not a very nice time. We go on as, um, as to, oh, the person Tom Nero gets older, his violence towards animals has then changed into violence against people, and he kills this lady, I'm sure she's a very good high repute, in the street, and he is caught and he is sentenced to death, and at the end of it, from uh, the, te the moral of this tale is basically do unto animals as you would be done by because at the end of it he's hung and he's cut down and then the doctors um, dissect his corpse in front of a, um, an audience and it's the kind of inhumanity to man is, is where we're going and all starting from this beginning of cruelty towards animals. So um, if we can perhaps suggest that humans' attitudes towards animals is some kind of um, a proxy for their attitudes towards each other, can we transfer this back into the past? So starting from that question, I, um, I have done this, I, I did some research into it, and I've come up with three um, case studies that I will go into today, um, just because of time, basically. So the first of these is going to be looking at symbolic roles that animals can play, um, and the, particularly the change from pagan Saxon period to the Christian medieval period. We look at political moves. Um, so um, particularly focusing on the long 16th century. So I'll move to in the second case study. And then the rise of pets, looking at the romanticism of the 18th century, bringing us up to the modern day. Okay, so my um, data set that I started off with, um, this was during my um, original review that I was carrying out for Historic England um, on Southern England. So it's basically um, Oxford and Gloucestershire and south of that line. Uh, it's where my data set has come from. And I've broken it up into several um, periods. So there's the early Saxon period and the middle Saxon period, which we'll kind of <coughs> put together. So that's the immediate post-Roman period going into the um, 9th century. Then the late Saxon and early medieval period. Um, so the Norman period, the Norman conquest, just before and just after that. Uh, then we've got the high medieval period, late medieval, and then coming into the post-medieval and modern period. So these are the number of sites and the, the types of sites that I looked at um, as my basic data set for the regional review. And so this is where I get my um, zooarchaeological data that I've, that I've used um, as a basic starting point to address this question of how people treat animals in the past. Can we use it for their attitudes and cultural change as well? So not only looking at the zooarchaeology, but I'm also looking at documentary sources, art history and anthropology as well. So starting off looking at the uh, pagan Saxon period, um, it's quite clear that there's a, um, an importance <coughs> of the natural world in Saxon cosmology. So um, they use a lot of natural symbolism in their um, artwork. And you may be 
um, familiar with. I'm going to have to skim over some areas because, just because of time and because of the, uh, the um, uh, depth of the subject. But what we can see in the zooarchaeological um, record are that animals are used as markers of routine rituals. Um, and for this is uh, represented by the finding of dogs and cattle skulls in sunken feature buildings. So if you're not familiar with Saxon archaeology, um, this is a reconstruction of a sunken feature building. So it's basically a hut. And underneath the floor of the hut is a pit, which is why they have a sunken feature. So they're quite easily identifiable archaeologically. Um, there's a floor over the, um, the pit in the ground. Um, there's lots of, lots of suggested uses for, the, for these pits, perhaps weaving sheds or storage <coughs> sheds. But what, is, what happens once they finish being um, in use um, a, an awful lot of the time to the point where if someone excavates um, an SFB and it hasn't got a cat skull at the bottom or a dog skeleton in it or a cat skeleton in it, then that's more unusual than the ones that do. Okay, so um, here's one being that's been excavated and um, basically what happens is when it goes out of use, the midden deposits from the settlement are chucked into the pit to fill it up along with um, certain um, <coughs> place deposits, so like I say, cat skulls, dogs, um, sometimes cats, and um, whole vessels or nearly whole vessels. So as well as being um, a means of refuse disposal, we also have these symbolic deposits put in there. So this is a kind of everyday use. It seems to be that it's like you finish with an area of the site, you fill it up with uh, rubbish, and you move on to the next area. So this is happening in the day-to-day -day cycles of Saxon, period, Saxon people. And then we have animals that are used as companions in the afterlife. So this is an inhumation burial um, from Canterbury, and just here is a little dog um, that's buried alongside <coughs> this group, uh, this family group. And we also see it in cremation burials as well. Um, so this is an example of the uh, Spong Hill cremations, um, where you can see that we have dogs buried along, uh, cremated alongside people, um, and put it and being put into the cremation urns. And then lastly, um, animals in the Saxon period are also used as um, totems or as sim uh, symbols of power or strength or a particular um, feature of that animal that can be transferred to the wearer. So here we have um, a necklace which has um, teeth from a wild boar and two dogs. And here we have um, a raptor um, that's used to symbolise um, a shield ornament. So presumably transferring ideas of strength and power onto the, the wearer of that shield. So with the coming of Christianity, you see this massive change. And it must have been quite a notable change because um, there's a sudden stop in the amount of animals accompanying human burials. Um, so this is um, an early medieval burial from uh, St John's College in Cambridge. No animals uh, alongside the inhumations. And if we look in the archaeological record, um, so these are the number of dogs, ABG, so by ABG I mean a, a, a group of bones, associated bone group, which are, um, so presumably at some point would have been the whole animal placed in a, a deposit. Um, <clears throat> and in the early and middle Saxon period you see, although the sample sizes are small, so the numbers in brackets are the sample sizes, they are quite small, but you do find um, the, the, <coughs> the instances of dog ABG that generally um, um, that, that, that's how we find them buried in a, in a pit on their own. Um, from the <coughs> late Saxon early medieval period, when we find these ABGs, they tend to be more in refuse deposits. So they're just chucked in with everyday refuse. There's probably more than one in a, uh, at a time. They're scattered around. So they're treated more um, as rubbish rather than as an accompaniment or a symbolic um, aspect for them. And again, in the post-medieval period, we have this small band where we've got a few um, deliberate burials of dogs, which we'll come back to later, so remember that chart, okay? Or this one <laughs> of that chart. Okay, so important to this, uh, integral to this change of um, ideas in the medieval period is the chain of being. So as Christianity comes in, there's a very definite hierarchy of, um, of who's important in the Christian world. Obviously at the top we have God, then the angels, then <coughs> humans of who the king is is uh, the greatest, the most powerful. Then we have mammals. Um, within these, we have the lion as the king of the animals. Wild animals are 
are one rung above domestic animals. Then we have birds. The eagle is the most powerful <coughs> of the, um, the birds in Christianity. Then we have fish, plants, and minerals at the bottom. Okay, so having this kind of um, outlook, so this idea that, that humanity has dominance over animals and birds, um, is maybe not makes it not quite so surprising that you don't find animals as being buried with human with humans or with um, or used as symbolic deposits because if if you take the Christian view um, animals have no soul and so how then can they go to an afterlife so if there's no soul no chance of an afterlife they're below humans on the on the ladder then there's no point in burying them. They are just rubbish. When they, once they've died, they're just rubbish. They go out with all the rest of the rubbish. But what does happen to animals at this point in time is that they become allegorical. So they are used to portray human characteristics. They're used as exemplars um, and to, to personify moral attributes. So for an instance, um, you see quite often in uh, medieval tombs, <coughs> we have people, effigies of people with, their, with animals at their feet. And this tends to represent how they would have been in life. So the dog, this is a dog, it looks a bit like a pig, but it is a dog. And it represents loyalty in life. And the lion represents courage and power. Okay? So it changes um, from companionship to uh, more, of being, uh, more of a metaphorical meaning. Mm-hmm. Animals are portrayed in vestuaries um, from early in the medieval period. This is, um, this is one example. So it was used as a way to... Uh, vestries were used as a way to tell people about um, about the animals they might see around them. So, in this case, a bear was believed to lick her cub into shape. It was born as an amorphous mass, and, and the bear would lick the, bear, the baby bear into shape. This is an illustration of Aesop's fables. So, this is an example of a way that animals were used um, in storytelling to let the uh, the general population <clears throat> know how they should live their lives. So, this is a dog that's greedy and he's by the river and he's carrying uh, some meat in his mouth and he sees another dog in the water reflected back at him and he wants that meat as well as his own meat so he drops his meat into the river to try and get the other meat and the meat's gone and he gets no meat so don't be greedy or you'll lose your meat into the river so that's one example and the church used animals in this way to put, uh, to transmit ideas of morality and uh, biblical stories to the laity who um, at this point in time were, um, couldn't read or write. Um, so, if we have a contrast of these uh, symbolic roles of animals, um, we do see a large change. So there's a massive change going on um, socially and um, within religion between the pagan Saxon period and the Christian medieval period that happens in this late Saxon period, at the end of the middle Saxon period, beginning of the late Saxon period, where um, Christianity um, is brought back with a force into England. Uh, so animals change from having an integral role in the symbolic lives of people to being thought of as a part, and they are now lower than, um, than people. They have no place. They, they are not equals anymore. Man is dominant over animals. So um, instead of having this ability to transfer strength from animal to person, uh, from being a suitable companion in death to accompany a person to the afterlife, and from having a symbolic place in daily rituals, um, they are—they have no soul. They have no place in the um, everyday spiritual life of people. Okay, so that's the first case study. Uh, then to look at political views, so things like status and um, how the the, um, the, uh, the politics of the country are shown is a massive topic. I know. So I'll just start off. Look a little bit at status to get some background to this long 16th century. <coughs> So the early and middle Saxon period, uh, the world views seem to be fairly narrow. There's no exotic animals that we find. So along here, I've uh, got a list of the introduced species that occur at the different periods of time. As you can see, early and middle Saxon period, we have no introduced species. There's no uh, exotic taxa that we find in the archaeological record. But in the late Saxon and early medieval period, you can see we've got um, the introduction of fallow deer, which uh, now has been placed at the... Uh, during the late Saxon period, um, and in the early medieval period, so that following the Norman conquest, we get things like rabbits, peacocks, and pheasants that are occurring. Um, and this is, um, implies increased trade and contact with other cultures, and that animals are now being brought in um, as, as um, 
statements of power and status. Oh my gosh. No question. <laughs> okay, so you can see here the uh, 11th century uh, lovely drawing of Nottingham Castle. So we can see this empire patient. So we've got the castle at the top, there's a big wall around the edges, and then we've got deer and wild boar and rabbits um, and then hounds inside. And this big wall symbolises this um, distance between the, uh, the people that don't have it on the outside of the wall and people that do have it on the inside of the wall. So animals are used um, for the display of wealth and power. And it's embodied in this feudal system. So the idea that the Lord have it and the people on the outside don't have it. We get early menageries um, and parks which remain in the hands of the elite throughout the medieval period. So any exotic taxa that we get tend to be at very high status sites. Um, and so, for example, this is a Barbary ape. Uh, this isn't actually it, but this is a Barbary ape skull, <laughs> and one of them was found in uh, high medieval Southampton. So we start to get some really exotic taxa turning up in this period. And then what happens is we get the long 16th century, the end, uh, which sees the end of the feudal system. We have the Reformation. The English state becomes centra uh, more of a centralised, formalised government. Uh, there's a reduction in power to the aristocracy as we have the end of the feudal system. So we have, tend to have one king, and then we now have a government. But it allows this increase in the middle classes. So we have more spending power, um, <coughs> uh, more um, capitalism coming in for the, the middle classes. So they've got more money to dispose of. And can we see this in the animal record? Well, of course we can, or else I wouldn't be telling you about it. <laughs> um, uh, so moving quickly on. What happens, so him having post medieval period, turkeys arrive, and uh, work that's here, Father Girl has done on turkeys, suggests that whereas the, uh, the animals that arrived in two species earlier on in the medieval period stayed in this, uh, were in parks, they were within the domain of the aristocracy, turkeys come in, and yeah, they might start, they started off at high status sites, dotted around, but very quickly they become democratised. So they were accessible to everyone, and you get um, lower status. Um, Households that are keeping turkeys in the backyard very quickly. So, um, these people have a bit more money, they can buy these new, have got more power to buy the, these new introductions. Bear gardens crop up. So, although um, you may know that dog baiting, cow, bull baiting, bear baiting was going on, it's been going on for as long as anyone's had a, a dog and a cow or a, whatever. But what happens at this point is that we get bear gardens turning up. So, this is where um, it becomes accessible for, for people to pay and go to see them. So it's a kind of a formalisation of entertainment and increase in disposable wealth. And you find the remains of, uh, of animals from bear fights, particularly in this area of London, uh, Southwark. And we have uh, a move to education. So these expanding world views, people going out to um, Africa, bringing back unusual animals. And we have an increase in education, people wanting to know more about the, the history <coughs> The, uh, the natural historic world. Um, and we've got two lovely sites. This one is uh, the Ashmolean Museum that Sheila Hamilton Dyer excavated and she found raccoon and manatee bones and she also found a very large collection of dogs. Some of them had saw marks on which suggested that they were perhaps used for comparative anatomy or dissection if we're being generous, vivisection if we're not being generous. Okay, and then another site that uh, Jim Morris has... Um, has published work on. This is the Royal London Hospital and this is um, a Moona monkey that was found alongside um, other dissected remains, uh, which suggests that this was indeed used for comparative anatomy. So you're, ex you're um, dissecting human corpses and alongside them you're dissecting primates as well, just to see the differences. And I've still got time. So very quickly, the rise of urbanism in the 18th century sees this um, increase in pets. I say <laughs> pets, um, what we have is a change to the, um, in the artistic record, animals are now being painted in their own right. So you will have portraits of animals, rather than portraits of animals with people as property, you're having a picture of an animal as an animal, just because it's, a, it's your pet. Um, we've got the tomb of Lord Byron's dog, which actually is taller than Lord Byron himself, um, but it suggests that animals are coming out of this separation between us and them. They, there's a, there's now removal of the idea that they have no souls, they're being seen as less mechanistic. Um, they're being re recognised as more similar to humans. And this is Lord Byron's um, epitaph to his dog, um, which at the end of it 
recognise them as having all the virtues of man without his vices. So, again, bringing back this idea that animals and people um, can be similar and are integral to each other's lives. So, sorry. Okay, so, uh, and this, this is, in this 18th century, this is the first time we get pet burials in individual graves. Okay, so these three sites is the first time in the archaeological record that I can find from the southern region that you've got separate and dogs. Okay. Mm-hmm.